1960s saw a change in the social fabric of America, and the university district embraced these changes. Alternative kinds of organizations came together, the Columbus Tenants Union, Columbus Community Food Co-op, Open Door Clinic, the Columbus Free Press was one of a succession of underground or alternative newspapers at that time. There was a lot of alternative politics and, of course, the alternative merchants. Charlie's Guitar was the first shop that started selling uh, pea coats, underground comics, all the underground newspapers. And I sold rock and roll clothes, satin shirts with covered buttons and great big collars, bell bottoms that were so wide you fell over them when you tried to walk. The whole block became like a cultural center, and it was on 13th. We renamed the whole area Pearl Alley. A lot of clubs opened. The Varsity Club, of course, Andy Capps. The Agora was the big one. The Sugar Shack was a huge bar. One of the most popular groups to ever play there was Bob Seeker. Folk singing was very political. People like Phil Oakes was playing at a place on High Street called the Sacred Mushroom. Along with the peace, love, and rock and roll, a darker undercurrent brood. I always thought of myself more as a beatnik than a hippie because the hippies kept thinking that everything was going to turn out all right. And the beatniks just were not so sure about that. This is also a time of uh, growing awareness in civil rights. Court cases about censorship. The women's movement was just kind of stirring up. It was getting started. John Kennedy was assassinated, then Martin Luther King, then his brother, Bobby. So that had huge influence on us. Young people start questioning what they've always known, and it hits the student body at OSU. They begin to question authority. They begin to question their government. The thing that really gelled it was the war in Vietnam, because at that time there was a draft, and so everyone was subject to being drafted, and which means everyone had an opinion on whether they wanted to go or not. And people didn't know much about Vietnam, and they said, well, we gotta do it, and the government says we need to do it. But as things went on and more and more came out, people started questioning it. Well, why exactly are we there? And do we need to go there? And do we have a choice? And do I want to die in some rice paddy in Asia? Professors, students, and residents protested side by side. I had been a conscientious objector serving within the armed forces uh, during the late stages of the Korean War. And I offered counseling to students about seeking conscientious objection. Every demonstration grew and grew and grew. There were demonstrations around the ROTC building, around the administration building. I was a veteran. I was interested primarily in finishing school. Everyone else on the planet seemed to be intent on shutting school altogether. Little events that seem to spark off what one person calls a demonstration, but somebody else would call a riot. On April 29th, 1970, one such spark erupted into a full-blown riot. To this day, there is still confusion over what started the unrest. It was a drug deal gone bad. Afro-Am, the black students, were picketing Denny Hall. There were people blocking entrances to buildings, um, basically trying to shut the campus down. So when I got off the bus, I was absolutely amazed to walk into what was like a war zone. It was a completely polarized campus throughout the country. It gave us all a sense of hopelessness and yet a sense of empowerment, that if we stood together, they could kill some of us, but they couldn't get us all. And it, it was sad to have it come down to us and them. But at that point, it did. And some of us were them. I was in the Ohio National Guard. I remember when we were called out, they gave us live ammunition, and it was pretty scary to think that they, they really would want you to shoot somebody. The riots went on for several days. It was a very bizarre scene. I remember at one end of the Oval, Army or National Guard people advancing on students. At the other end of the Oval, people were throwing Frisbees. So it was a very strange juxtaposition. I think they all began to reconsider the immensity of what could happen in a situation like this. 
a lot of instructors, uh, professors who would, would volunteer to go out on the campus and, and mentor both the troops and the, particularly the students. You behave the way that responsible students should behave. In response to the chaos, Columbus Mayor Sensenbrenner imposed a curfew on the university district. Anyone on the streets was subject to arrest. The campus was a cordoned off area. It was under a military situation. There were checkpoints at every alley and every street. My parents wanted me to move home. And it was somewhere between, this is too exciting and you wouldn't understand anyway. Nobody could have predicted that a demonstration at another Ohio campus would end in tragedy. On May 4, 1970, at Kent State University, an on-edge National Guard reacted, some would say overreacted, and fired, killing four students and wounding nine others. OSU is the battleground. Kent State is where they reacted, and it was deadly. I was going to Europe, and I got off the plane in Heathrow Airport. Here was this famous picture from Kent State. And I f found myself completely flummoxed because my European friends wanted me to explain, and I suddenly realized that I couldn't. Protests erupted again and continued for several days. Then, on May 6th, Ohio State President Fawcett, with the urging of Ohio Governor James Rhodes, shut down the campus. The university remained closed for two weeks. It was like bursting a balloon, all the uh, pressure of the events of the day that had kept that balloon of protest so full had, had burst and there was nothing. It was gone, it was over. Over, but not necessarily back to normal. We came from being children to being adults in this place. Adults with a new purpose. Comfest came out of a lot of the same people who were involved in the, the counterculture activities, but also a lot of the people who were political. So that we had a way to disseminate the information that all of these different organizations wanted to talk to people about. Food co-op, student union. The stage was set up on the triangle at the corner of Waldeck and 16th, which was between the Hillel Foundation, the Wesley Foundation, the United Christian Center. Everything has to go to the next generation. It's a whole different kind of a festival now. It is monstrous. 